If you have a Bible, please open to Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Today we'll be looking at verses 1 through 15. If you don't have a Bible, I encourage you to grab one in the pew. Um, there may not be one right there in front of you, but somewhere in your pew, you probably will find a Bible. It'll be page, on page 380. 380. If you don't have that, uh, you can also just grab your phone. Or, yeah, just grab your phone. It'd be more beneficial for you to have the text open in front of you as we move through these verses so that you can see for yourself what God has said concerning these matters. If you're having trouble finding it, you can go right to the middle of your Bible. It might be in the Psalms, and then you can just flip forward a few pages, and you're going to run into it eventually. All right, so if you found your way there, please go ahead and stand. And I will read Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 15, a, a passage that you no doubt have heard sometime in your life. For everything, there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. What gain has the worker for his toil? I have seen the busyness that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also, that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God has done it so that people fear before him. That which is already has been, that which is to be already has been, and God seeks what has been driven away. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Several years ago, our family took a vacation to Florida, uh, to, Disney, to Disney World. And I was, while the kids were very excited about that, um, and we had to spend time with my parents and my sister and do all that stuff. What I was most excited about was going to R.C. Sproul uh, to, to his church. And this was about five months maybe before R.C. Sproul died. You know, R.C. Sproul, probably the greatest, I think, theologian of our time. And I say that because he can communicate theology. And if you know theology you can't communicate it, then it's worthless, right? But he's that guy. Right? He makes so, so many complex things simple. And uh, so he's kind of like, you know, a, a hero of mine. So we, we go to R.C. Sproul's church. We drive there. And providentially, he just happens to be preaching. You know, he's pretty old. He's got the oxygen on, all that stuff. We didn't know when he'd be preaching, but he was preaching that service. Now, his church is, is orchestrated in a way that it has a sense of grandeur just when you come in. But here is what was most impressive to me. Before the service began... Um, one of the pastors stood up and said, we'll now observe a time of silence so that we can prepare to worship God. And so for five minutes, everyone was silent. And it was a time appointed for reverence to, to take our minds off of the things of the world and to begin to, to stand in awe of who God is. And so for five minutes, and when everyone's silent, that can almost seem like a long time. 
five minutes of, of only silence and time is just ticking by. So five minutes goes by and I'm five minutes older, but five minutes spent standing in reverence of God. And I'll never forget that time, that time for reverence. Time is an interesting thing if you think about it. I began to think about time, and I thought about it a lot looking at this passage. And I think what we learn here can alter the way that you understand reality and how you look at time. If you, in your 70-year lifespan, I, I found this, in the time that you have, hopefully you'll live more than 70 years, but if you just get 70, you're going to spend 20 years sleeping, 20 years working, 6 years eating, 7 years in recreation, 5 years getting dressed. I mean, that's, that's kind of depressing, right? <laughs> 1 year talking to someone on the phone, probably not George because he doesn't answer his phone, but 1 year of George texting on his phone. Um, and if you smoke, smokers would spend two and a half years smoking. That's pretty wild. Two and a half years in bed, sleeping. <laughs> wasted time, right? We think it's wasted, but it's crazy to think about this stuff. Three years waiting for somebody. That one got me. And if you're in the military, you could probably up that by like another three years, because that's all you do in the military is wait around. Five months tying your shoes, and then two and a half years doing other things. Um, and you only get so much time, and it's gone. But have you ever just wondered, just sit and thought, like, what, what is time? What is it? Well, we describe it, people, as the apparent progression of events into the past and then into the future. As intelligent, temporal beings that are bound by time, really anyone, regardless of their education level, understands time. Right? It's kind of like the air that we breathe. It's our reality. We understand that time is slipping away into the past and we're gliding into the future. And the present moment is fleeting and it's gone. Now there's obviously more advanced under ways to understand time. Matter in motion, uh, uh, there's time dilation, that time can actually become relative to the speed of an observer and a location of obser observer and all of that stuff. Um, but still, nevertheless, time, whatever your perception is slipping away. And even a child understands these basic concepts. They might not get it right all the time because, you know, they might have done something yesterday. Like Evangeline, she was at their grandparents yesterday, and she might say, remember last year when I was at my grandparents' house? Like, yeah, I do. It was yesterday, right? But they, but they got that. And tomorrow I'll go back? Yes, tomorrow. You'll go back tomorrow. And we created a variety of ways to measure time. We've always been keeping track. At the very beginning, it was just, you know, watching the stars, watching the sun, watching the seasons. It's spring, it's summer, it's fall, winter, then it's spring again. Uh, the lunar, lunar time, uh, the moon, there's a new moon, the progressions of the moon, and then there's a full moon. Early, we had sundials, humanity created sundials, and so it was kind of like a you know, the community could have like one time. It's just a pillar in the, in the city. And as the sun would cast shadows, everybody could kind of know what time it was. And of course, we've gotten more and more advanced. And so we created, you know, with our technology clocks and people could have their own, their own time in their house. And eventually clocks that were mobile and we had them on our wrist. And now if you're like me, you probably don't have one because you have the time on your phone. And everybody knows the time, and yet everybody's still late all the time. Now, you might be asking at this point, why are you talking about time? Why are you talking about time so much? Well, because this passage is all about time. It's all about time. The word time appears 30 times in chapters 3, verses 1 through 11, and 28 times in this little poem on time. Now, when a word appears over and over and over in a passage, especially something like 30 times, then you have to understand that this is a point that's trying to be driven home. And that has to become then the lens through which you begin to read the passage. Now, I understand that often you probably have heard this passage 
presented in a way about like when it's appropriate to do things and not appropriate. But this is not what this is not what this passage really is trying to communicate. So when we look at it from this way of time, we're going to learn two lessons today that time teaches us. Two lessons. Now, the question then is, why is this passage dominated by time? Why does Solomon go here? Remember what he's doing. Solomon is the author of this book. He writes as probably an older man looking back. He's writing wisdom. And wisdom is how do you live in God's world according to God's ways and his laws. And, but he does it in a very different way than, than the book of, uh, of, of Proverbs or even any other wisdom literature. This book, he comes at it in a very, I don't want to say, uh, it's like a holy skepticism. right? He wants you to... Come to this reality. Life, if you just live your life under the sun, that's the repeated phrase, and we saw this, it's been introduced already. If you just live your life in this material world with little, little, little to no regard to God whatsoever, right? Today, that could be an atheist or agnostic or even a professing Christian who just lives really whatever. God's real, maybe, who knows, um, but I don't ever pay attention. I just live my life for this world right out here in front of me. If you just live your life like that, what does Solomon tell us in chapter one? What did we learn? We learned that life is vain. Vanity of vanities. It's repeated over and over. That life is only full of emptiness. And that's all you find if you live that way as a secular materialist. That's the term we use today. Solomon didn't use that term, but that's what we use. If you're going to live like that, life is Empty, completely empty. Then he says, what can you gain? What can a man do to gain life in this world? And the answer is nothing. He took us on a quest last week. So last week we looked at his journey that he took us on. And in that journey, he says, I'm going to seek out to see what can give me gain. What could fill me up in this world? He has all resources. He's a king. He has all power. He can do whatever he wants. So the first thing he did is he sought it in wisdom. Can wisdom satisfy the deepest longings of the human heart? And it can't. So he moved on. So he tried philosophies. Then he tried pleasure. He was an absolute hedonist. That's what we call it. So he sought all pleasures of any kind that you could pick. And we went all through them. It's still the ways people try today. And he says it failed. So then he compared the two together. He said, okay, what's better? To try to live for wisdom and to be wise or to pursue madness and folly. That's kind of his term for a, a hedonist. He said, I compared the two and I said, it doesn't even matter because I'm going to die. <laughs> so this is kind of a, the angle he goes down, right? It's kind of depressing. It doesn't even matter if I pursued all this wisdom or whatever because in the end I'm, I'm going to die. So it becomes kind of a nihilist. That's what we call it today. It's living as if nothing matters at all. There's no point in anything. Of course, nobody can live like that. So he continues to examine, and he becomes one who hates life. That's today called a misanthropist. But he says, I hated my life. And so he hates his life because he sees that he's wasted all this time and that all of the wealth and his power and his kingdom, he's probably going to have to leave it to somebody who is a fool and isn't wise. But he doesn't stay there. He gives us a little glimmer of hope. Remember this book, the, uh, the main point comes at the very end. But to get there, so we don't all just jump out a window, he gives us a little glimmer of hope. <laughs> and he says that the point of life, and we call this the Yahwist, Yahweh from Yahweh, right? That's someone who lives under the sovereignty of God. The point of life is not to be a seeker of pleasure in the world or joy or ultimate fulfillment in anything in the world, but to be a receiver from God. Whether you eat or drink today or you work in your toil, receive it from God with joy and live in the present moment. Don't live in the past, don't live in the future. Live right now as a gift from God. That's what we saw last week. So now in our passage today, Solomon does something very wise as the wisest man that ever lived. He creates a master lesson which reorients our life and gives us a proper understanding of who man is and who God actually is. Or, of course, men and women, or boys and girls, who you are and who God is. And he does does so doing using something as universal as the air that we breathe, something all of us can escape, we all experience, using time. In Romans 1, 
Paul will say that all men are without excuse. Now, he doesn't list time, but he lists things of creation, that God's in creation, God's power is known to everyone. Now, Solomon takes a similar approach, I think, but he comes at it with this idea of time. No one can escape time. And time has two lessons to teach us today, and that's what we're going to see. John Calvin, one of his famous quotes is this, Our wisdom, insofar as it ought to be deemed true and solid wisdom, consists almost entirely of two parts, the knowledge of God and the knowledge of ourselves. And he says you can't truly know yourself apart from the knowledge of who God really is, and we really don't have any way of understanding God other than how he's revealed himself to us as finite creatures. So knowledge of God, knowledge of man is true wisdom. And this is exactly what this text offers today to you. That's why you should pay close attention. So don't just tune out. You want to pay attention so you don't miss these great lessons. There are great lessons taught that, that time teaches us so that we can have a true wisdom, a knowledge of ourselves, and a knowledge of God. So that's my purpose today, is to give you a true knowledge of yourself, but ultimately that you might know God as he truly is and stand in awe of who he is. So let's look at these today. Two lessons revealed by time. Number one, time reveals the limitation of man. Ben Franklin said, Do you love life? Then do not squander time, for that's the stuff that life is made of. I really like that quote. Time is the stuff that life is made of. And that's exactly what Solomon is doing here in this section. If you look at your text in 1 through 8, what Solomon has, has done is he has created a poem, a poem of time, but he's, and he structured it in such a fashion. There are seven verses, and if you know, seven is like the number of completeness in the Bible. There are seven days of creation, so he has seven verses, but they're paired, 14 lines, but seven verses in a poem about time or seasons, or the appointed, appointed times. And as you look here at this, what you're going to see, he's trying to communicate so, something that would say, okay, I can't give you everything every person ever would ever experience in their life, but I can give you what kind of encapsulates a human life, the things you're going to encounter. And there's always a positive and a negative, because you're always going to face two kinds of seasons in life. You're going to have great times of pleasure and joy, and then there's always times of pain and discomfort and discouragement. And, the, and that's how they're grouped together. There's a positive and a negative, and they're put so as to one cancels the other. Positive cancels the negative, and negative cancels the positive. So he structures it in this way, and verse 1 begins, For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. Here's what it means. There is an appointed time for everything that happens under the sun. Right? That's his term, but here he uses under heaven. There's an appointed time for everything that happens under heaven in every event that occurs in the world. The focus is time, and it's re this repetition, it creates kind of a cadence almost. I can't help but be reminded of like a clock, though you know, I don't think he had clocks, but there's the cadence, and it's just reminding you over and over that there's appointed times for everything. Now, don't read it in a moralistic way. It's probably maybe the way you've encountered it. I know I've encountered it that way. You know, um, Psalm is not trying to teach you not to uh, make jokes and laugh at people's funerals. It's not the point. He's not trying to teach you what's appropriate and not appropriate in each time. That's a moralistic way of reading these passages. It's not what he's doing. And verse 1 is, is kind of just screaming at you to not do that. There's an appointed time. What's the question you should ask? I'm not telling you to read between the lines because it's right there. Who's the appointer? Who appoints these times? And that's what you need to keep in mind as we move through these. The poem begins where we all begin, at the beginning of life. There's a time to be born and a time to die. You didn't decide when you were born. No person has ever decided that and the time of your, uh, of your death, just like your birth has been appointed. 
So he hits it there, the beginning and the end, the time of your birth, the time of your death. And so obviously everything in between uh, comes into view. Psalm 139, 16 says this, Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was not one of them. And this is the biblical truth of our lives, is that every single day of our life has already been appointed by God before you were born. This is, some say, a high view of God. I don't like that. I just say this is the biblical view of God. If you don't have that view, then you have a wrong view of God. Not a high view and a low view. There's only a right view and a wrong view. So we take God for what he has said at his word. And we aren't in control of any of these things. That should become apparent to you. And that is why he starts as he does. And time teaches us that lesson. You can't escape it, whether you're a believer or not. You are not in control of your life. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted is coupled with this. Now, I'm not a farmer, but I know some basic stuff, okay? Mainly because I have gone dove and pheasant hunting in Kansas. And one time I shot a pheasant and it landed in a cornfield and I had to walk in there. I had to walk into that corn and it's corn as far as the eye can see above your head. It's incredible. Now here's what I know about corn. You plant corn in the spring and you take it up in like September, October, in the fall. And we didn't make that time. Right? That's the point of what he's, of, he's, of he's saying here. There's appropriate seasons. They're not governed by man. Now, if you think you are independent of God and his appointments of time, try to plant your corn in the fall. Do a little experiment yourself and see how far you get. That's the point that he's making, right? Next, ver- the next verse, a time to kill and a time to heal. There are certain times in life when killing is called for. We live in a fallen world. This is reality. You have to live by this reality. Someone breaks into your house in the middle of the night, right? You don't, you don't come in and say, excuse me, sir, would you like to have a cup of tea with me? And uh, let's discuss the, the current political climate in our, in our fine country, right? You don't do that. Right? Someone breaks into your house. You love your family. You love your wife. You wake up. It's killing time. Right? There is an appropriate time to kill. There's also an appropriate time to heal. And the two aren't ever confused or you're insane. Right? So we have first responders in our church and they come upon a crash, a car crash, and the fire trucks arrive and they use the jaws of life and they pull someone out. Right? What do they do? They don't take a pillow and stuff it on their face. They render aid. They get the first aid, all their supplies, and they try to start to save someone's life. These times... You live in them. You can't escape them. You didn't set them. You didn't appoint them. They are the fabric of reality. They're appropriate times that are appointed by God. There's a time to break down and a time to build up. There comes a time when you just got to tear down a building. You got to destroy it. You got to do away with it so you can build something new, right? Yankee Stadium, though it was incredible, it's like a, a, a place that everyone had to go. I went to old Yankee Stadium. And I saw the Yankees fans throwing batteries at players. I couldn't believe it. It was insane. Uh, but they tore it down. And they built new Yankee Stadium. Because there, there comes a time when things get so old, you tear them down. They break down, and you've got to build them back up. Only a madman goes to a, a new building and goes, you know what, let's destroy this building today. These are the realities which we live. There's a time to weep and a time to laugh, and that's coupled together with a time to mourn and a time to dance. There are times, obviously, like a funeral, where it would be really, really inappropriate and weird if you, ha- if you were to hire like a stand-up comedian for a special event. You go to special- this comedian, you say, hey, uh, you do birthday parties? Yeah, I do birthdays, I do whatever, uh, anniversaries. How about a, how about a funeral? Be really inappropriate and weird, right? And yet, even though there are these times where it is only appropriate to weep and to mourn, life's full of times where you have to laugh. That's all you can do is laugh and dance and celebrate. 
You redeploy. It's a time for great happiness and dancing, births, celebration, birthdays, laughing. These times govern our reality in our life. Our entire, and our entire existence really is governed by these appointed times. Who made it appropriate to only mourn at death? We didn't do that. A time to cast away stones, a time to gather stones. It's coupled together with a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. Casting away stones is more than likely a reference to what you do in this period of time to an enemy's field so that they can't plant food and like feed and support their armies. So 2 Kings 3, 18 through 19 uh, kind of references this. We read this there. This is a light thing in the sight of the Lord. He will also give the Moabites into your hand, and you shall attack every fortified city and every choice city, and shall fell every good tree and stop up all springs of water and ruin every good piece of land with stones. You know, throw stones all over their land. They can't farm. So gathering up stones, obviously just the opposite. There's a time you buy a plot of land, you're going to cut down all the trees, you're going to clear all of the rocks so that you can plant. And the two cancel each other out. It's coupled with uh, embracing and refraining from embracing. There's appropriate times to embrace, appropriate times not to embrace. If you want to test this theory, here's a challenge for you. Well, maybe I shouldn't say that because I don't want to be held accountable for what happens. But um, you can do this picture in your mind with me, if you will, that you get pulled over uh, for speeding. And the policeman comes to your car and says, sir, please stay in your car, put your hands on your wheel. And uh, when I tell you, give me your driver's license. And you, and you say, ah, you know what? He's like, you're just having a rough day. And you try to get out of your car and say, if you just bring it in, man, for a hug. Bring it in, man. That'll, that'll turn your frown upside down. You're going to be embracing the concrete, right? Time for embracing the street. Uh, we know this. We live by this. But there are times for embracing. Times to refrain from embracing. Again, this is a description of a variety of things that are appointed by God, times that govern the reality in which we live. <clears throat> A time to seek, a time to lose, a time to keep, a time to cast away. This is more than likely regarding possessions and wealth. We might say it's time to seek a job. It's time to leave a job. And we all know when those times come. Uh, a time to keep possessions, a time to throw away possessions. Right? There are times where, hey, no matter what, you just got to get rid of your stuff. Right? You're like you're, you're out on a boat, like Paul, the Apostle Paul, out on a missionary journey. Uh, uh, but they think they've got you, they're taking you prisoner, but it's all appointed by God, and the boat's about to sink. And what does everybody do? They say, hey, bring on the cargo ships, and let's load this sucker up with some more cargo. They throw them out. Throw everything overboard so we don't die. That's kind of what is communicated here. Now, you can fight this if you want. Um, I've experienced this before, uh, visiting uh, someone's house when I, when I went to, I used to be a plumber, went to a, uh, was actually an officer in the army, I could have told on him, because it was really weird. Um, and in their house they were a hoarder. You ever seen a hoarder's house? Really, really strange. It's a person who doesn't, who tries to fight this principle, that sometimes it's time to get rid of your stuff. <laughs> they keep literally everything. And so you walk in and you go, something's not right here, right? You can't keep everything. So he's hitting all of these times. A time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence, a time to speak. It was ancient customs in that time that when someone may die or something terrible happens that you would rend your clothing. You would take your, we'd say it, a shirt, and you would tear it. It was appropriate. Because you're, it's a, what is an appropriate response when something terrible happens? But there are other times when you're going to sew that up and it's time to move on. That's what's communicated there. A time for silence and a time to speak. There's no better illustration of this than Job's friends. There's no better. Right? Job's friends, eventually, right? he's sitting there on the, on, in the ash heap and he's like picking himself with his cracked pots 
and he's lost everything, and eventually his friends start talking, and Job doesn't need all of that talking. And what they say isn't helpful. It's actually not even correct. It's wrong, as we see at the end of Job. And you know that, right? Sometimes your friend just needs you to come sit down beside him and not say a thing and just be there with him. And there's a time to love, time for love, a time for hate, a time for war, a time for peace. Um, Everyone in America that was alive pre-September 11th knows this to be true. September 11th happened, and uh, the entire nation was unified. Democrat, Republican, Libertarian, Anarchist, I don't even care what you were. Everyone was unified. What time was it? It It's time for war. The earth rises, the earth sets. That's what he said in chapter 1. There's these cycles of life. He describes it. Then he creates this poem. Tells us about reality again, but using time and appointed times. Then comes the question in verse 9. Now your Bible probably maybe breaks it. These breaks are not in the text. This is how this poem ends with this question, which he already asked previously. What gain has the worker for his toil? And that answer, as we have already uncovered, is there's nothing gained. And that's how this poem is, is, is put together, that every appointed time cancels out the other, so there's no gain. You're born, you die. Time for war, a time for peace, a time for war. And this is the world in which we live, that you will toil and try to seek for meaning in this world. And the times have structured everything as an, in a way to reveal to you that no matter what you do, you're governed. Okay? We have this way of viewing ourselves as independent from God. But time reveals to us our limitations, that we didn't appoint these governing structures to reality. And we can't gain anything for all of our work and our toil under the sun. We're limited by a world of time. The, the Rolling Stones, they got it wrong. Time is not on your side. Time is running out. It's a time to be born and a time to die. Now, verse 10, if we look at verse 10, what does it mean? I, I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. Well, he already told us this. We looked at this last week in, in chapter 1. And that God has appointed that east of Eden, that is, after we have been cast out of the garden, and we live in a fallen world, that no toil, nothing we do will ever give us gain or make us full. And this is appointed by God. That all you'll find in every time in your life is ultimately no gain, frustration. Again, we're examining life from the humanist, uh, the secular materialist perspective. Verse 11 states that God has made everything appropriate in His time. That's kind of what the word beautiful means. It means more like appropriate, that there's an appropriate time. That's the meaning of the, the poem. And so it's kind of like, If we just embrace that reality, that one reality, that God has appointed everything in this world and all the times under the sun, we could at least just live. We we could just get by. But something nags at you that makes that an impossibility, that you could accept that reality and somehow actually be happy. There's something nagging. There's just that thing where you know something's off in this world, something's just not quite right, and you're longing for some other thing or place, you may not be able to put your finger on it, right? But you just know there's got to be something better than this world. That's verse 11b. We see what we're wired for. God has put eternity into our hearts. He's put eternity into our hearts. Every person who has ever lived feels as if they're living in a world in which they don't belong. Something's lacking here. There's something missing. And so rather than run and seek it for pleasure, what we ought to do is observe what Solomon does, as we're going to see here in 
take our eyes off the things of this world to see where we can find that. It's like there's a, a, a memory that's been passed down to you from your parents and your grandparents and your great-grandparents. It's like there's a little memory of, of Eden in your DNA. You know, I, I mean, I'm not like a geneticist, but I know that birds do things they're still trying to figure out, and it appears they can pass down memories through their genetics. So the offspring of, of some ducks, when they migrate, they'll find that their offspring will fly over the same group of trees. How do they do that? I don't know. Maybe it's a memory. I don't know about that, but here's what I do know. There's a memory of Eden passed down. You're made in God's image. God's put eternity in your heart. And so you know instinctively, and you can never lose the sense of longing. C.S. Lewis called it an inconsolable longing and a nostalgia for the future. And I really love that phrase, a nostalgia for the future. What's nostalgia? Nostalgia is like a sentimental like longing of some event or thing in your past uh, that made you that where you were really happy. And then something can trigger it, a smell, a song, or whatever, and you get that sense of nostalgia. And we, we, we recently drove through the town where we met, Angie and I, Hutchinson. We hadn't been back there in like, I don't even know, 20 years. And we drove them around. You know, this is where I asked your mom to marry me. And it was a trip down memory lane. It was nostalgic. And that was, thinking about it, it was probably one of the best years of my entire life. I had no responsibilities at all other than getting ready to pitch in the next game. And then hanging out with Angie. The best year ever. Right? And it, we're nostalgic about that type of stuff. But there's something nagging at us in our heart about living in this time-bound world where we can't find any gain under the sun. And that's this like longing and nostalgia for a place that you've never been. It's eternity. God has put eternity into every human heart. But east of Eden, we're governed by time. And time eventually runs out. And coupled with this heart knowledge of eternity comes another reality as we see here in the text. If you look back at your text in verse 11, we as mortals, we can never find out what God has done from beginning to end. Now, we know that God has appointed times and we have eternity in our heart and we try to grapple with and understand it, but we can never understand. God is, he's and fathomable to us. If we are to know what we are to know about God must come from His own revelation of Himself to us. And so we can never find out God's plan from beginning to end. But God does have a grand design. That's what's apparent in this text. God has a grand design. It encompasses eternity past. It moves into creation itself and even into the fall in Genesis 3. The casting out of Eden and his plan of redemption as he pursues his people and ultimately fulfills redemption in Christ. And then it goes even into new creation and beyond into eternity future. We can't in our own mortality even grasp that and search that out. So what are we to do as mortals bound by time? I'll look back at your passage. Verse 12, he takes us back to the lessons we learned last week. What do we do? We live as those that receive grace from God in the present. That's all we can do. We can stop seeking gain out there. We can stop living in the past or living for the future, and we can receive what God's given us now. Whether we eat or we drink or we toil, it's from God, and we're to enjoy life right now in the present. And that's what he says. This, too, is appointed by God, that in this very moment, you could have joy and live a good life, seeking to be a receiver of grace and not a seeker of pleasure in the world. So the first lesson that time reveals to us is man's limitation. Man is limited. The second time reveals that God is majestic. What is majestic? What is majesty? Uh, it's something that you should stand in awe of. 
So I've heard that if you go to the Grand Canyon, it's majestic. And when you get out of your car and you stand on the edge of it, you'll just stand there and stare out and be awestruck. Ever been there? I believe it. I've seen other great things in nature. And that's only a glimmer, right, of what our creator and his majesty is. This is what time reveals. Time reveals that God is majestic. We are temporal creatures. We're bound. God is atemporal. He's unbound. Time reveals the sovereign power, glory, greatness, grandeur, and majesty of God. How so? Well, first we have to understand how God relates to time. Understand that this is put together in a way as where you could see that all of this applies to you and none of it applies to God. All right, go back to verse 1. Appointed by who? Well, for there to be a, an appointed time for everything, there's got to be an appointer that's outside of that time. And that's God. God exists outside of time. We exist in time. And we're endlessly bound to have our life slip into the past and to have us slide into the future. And we experience change from the very time, first time that you were even conceived, you've been changing. And you're changing right now, and your cells are changing, and you're aging, and you, but you can't see it, but it's happening to you. You're sliding into the future, and the sands of time are going, and you're just changing. And everything in the world that is governed by time is changing. But there's one who never changes and will never change. He's timeless. He's eternal. We experience time in a linear fashion, a linear path. But God does not experience time as we do. God existed before time. Creation came into being and then time, matter in motion, there was time. But before there was time, there was God. God created time. And he doesn't move through time in a linear fashion like we do. Uh, God experiences time all at the same time. Well, we experience life sequentially. That is, our, our perspective on reality is such that we only experience a progression of events. God experiences time all at the same time because God exists outside of time. And so God's perspective on time is everything and every event simultaneously. Now, this may lead you to believe something that isn't true about God. That because he's timeless and he observes all things that have been or ever will be, he is somehow not intimate with his creation. And the word that we use is transcendent, and God is transcendent. But you would be wrong to believe that God is only an observer. Because God is more than an observer. God is intimately imminent in time. That means he is present in every place. Right? This is reality. Time and space. Space is a place. God is present in every space in all of time. At all times. That means God's here. That means where you go home, he'll be there. When you're 80 years old from now, he's already there with you. It is, we may would think that this is some type of just a theological thing that's not practical. But it's incredibly practical. I'll give you two scenarios, two different people, two different beliefs both have a crisis in their life. Two people have a crisis in their life. The first person prays to a God who's temporal. Temporal. That is merely bound in time. Who, who doesn't know all things because he's not in the future or in the past. He's, he's, like, he's like a co-pilot with you in life, Right? Like he's learning as this goes along. And this is the God some people believe in. And he's doing his best with you to help you out as you both navigate your life together. And so you can pray to that God if you want, but all he can do is the best he can. 
Then there's the person that prays to the God of the Bible, God as He is, the God who is timeless, eternal, transcendent, imminent, the one who is with you presently, the one who was with you when you were born, the one who is with you in the future, not will be, the one who is there in all times in between. He's already there in all of them. He sees all of reality, not as an observer, but one who's decreed all of reality. Why does the future exist? Because it exists in God's mind as God's decreed plan. This God knows how to take care of you. This God who's with you, literally think about it. Every second of your entire lifespan, God is with you and knows you. And you pray to that God, he knows you better than you know yourself. He knows what you will be. He knows what you need. He knows what will happen to you in literally every second of your life. So in a crisis, you pray to that God. What do you think brings more comfort? The God is just along for the ride, discovering life as you go along? Or the God that's already where you're going? I'll take the God of the Bible. The timeless, eternal God that's unbound, that doesn't change, transcendent and imminent in time and space. But what's he doing in time? What's God doing? Well, verse 13 tells us that God is carrying out his perfect, sovereign plan and purpose. He says, if you look at 14, I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken away from it. God has done it so that people fear before him. Nothing can be added to God's perfect plan. You can't add something to it and improve it, make it better. You can't take something away from it and you say, this shouldn't have been in my life. I wish it wouldn't have happened. There was no purpose for it. You can't take it away. Nothing. You can't add to God's plan. You can't take away from God's plan. It's perfect. Whatever he does endures forever. No moment of time is wasted in God's plan. It is all part of his perfect eternal plan. We can't see it. And of course, why can't we see it? Because we're time bound and we're limited. We say, I would change that in my life if I were God. If I, I know that that wasn't important in developing who I am. All it was is just a time of pain and suffering. It was meaningless time of pain and suffering. I would change it. That's because we don't have the, the correct perspective. We don't have the perspective to make that judgment. All we see is what's here. Right? Our perspective compared to God's perspective is like, it's like an infant toddler laying in his bed. Like he can't even roll himself over. All he can do is look up at the ceiling and the little toy thing that goes around. And when it, when it stops, he can cry for his mommy. Right? Meanwhile, God is above all of time and space and sees everything. And so we can't say, God's plan, your plan is not good. My timeline should have been different. God's plan is perfect. Proverbs 19.21 says, Many are the plans in the mind of man. You may have had many plans in your life. I know I have. And my life didn't go the way I planned. And this is what he says, But it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. Because God's purpose and his plan is perfect. Isaiah 46, 9 through 10 says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, there is no other. I am God, there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning. He declares the end from the beginning, not because he looks out and learns what's going to happen, but because he planned it all and decreed it all from eternity past. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will accomplish my purpose. Verse 15 re reiterates this timeless, unchanging, perfect, unfolding time according to God's plan. You can't change it. That which is, I just love it. Just think about this. For God, that which is already has been, and that which is to be, that's in the future, already has been. That might have confused you before, but hopefully not now, that you understand the timelessness of God. That which is already has been, and that which is to be already has been. You can't add to it or take away from it, right? We're not developing the, uh, 
the little quantum wristband that Tony Stark developed. I gotta throw this in there for the kids because I always perk up. We're not developing the band and we're not doing a time heist and going back in time and altering our current reality. It's, it's not gonna happen because God's unfolding of time is perfect. It's as if that which already or will be already is. You can't change God's plan. You can't even decide when to plant corn. That's been decided for you. You can't determine the time of your birth or your death. You're time-bound, limited, mortal. God is immortal, a temporal, unbound. But why? And here's the question. Why? Verse 14. Let's go back to verse 14. The end of verse 14 tells us why. So that people fear before him. What is that? That's what we started with. That's reverential awe. Time exists so that you would stand in reverential awe of God. God's purpose is to bring you to the place where you fall on your face before him in worship. Time reveals to you your total dependence on God, that you're frail, you're limited, but there's a God who is unlimited, unbound, unchanging, perfect, timeless, and time exists to remind you of that, right? Time exists, your time is past. Everyone has access to this knowledge. This knowledge is universal. This is Roman one, Romans 1 type of knowledge. Everyone experiences time. Everyone understands time. Everyone knows they don't appoint the times that are appropriate for this life. It reveals our frailty, and it reveals God's majesty as the appointer of the times and the seasons. Why are we so prone to forget this truth? We know this truth, we profess it a lot. Why are we so prone to forget it? Well, it's because we, I think, we get so busy in the world, we kind of just take our eyes off of this reality. Right? We stop spending time in the Word. We take our eyes off of who God is. And we, we forget. We forget so easily. Like, we're like the Israelites in the wilderness. They just saw God destroy Pharaoh's army. He parted the Red Sea. They go through the sea. Gigantic fire tornado. Angel of the Lord. Destruction destroys all of Pharaoh's armies. Takes them into the wilderness. They're rescued. Hooray. Celebrations all around. God is the most powerful, greatest God ever to be. Destroy all the idols. They go to the, to the mountain. God descends on the mountain in fire and there's lightning and he talks and everyone in the whole nation hears his voice and they fall on the ground. They say, oh, this God is too awesome and powerful. He is awe-inspiring, Moses. Go talk to him because we can't do it. What happens? How long till they forget? Not very long. They're making a golden calf. Then after they make the golden calf and he does all that stuff with them, and they repent. Then later they're grumbling. Then later they won't go in the promised land. Then later they won't live by God's covenant. And we're, we're, no, we're no different. We're no, we're no better. We forget the grace of God and his majesty so easily. And when we do, we're prone to major anxiety. That's what happens when we forget. We're prone to anxieties thinking we're in control of what happens in our life. This is the anxiety-killing view of God. Or we try to manipulate God, right? That's, how, that's another way we forget. We'll forget and we'll try to manipulate. Like, like we could manipulate God. We say, God, like with our behavior, like if I do this thing, God will respond and then I'll get this thing. We do that type of stuff when we forget the perfections of God and his majesty. Or perhaps we become too casual with God. This is, this is just everywhere. This is all over American Christianity today. Become too familiar and casual with God. As if God were merely just a buddy. He's just a buddy. He's like my buddy. Beth Moore, you know, you know who Beth Moore is, right? She writes all the Bible studies for ladies. She's been doing it for years. She made a tweet. I tell you guys, I'll take the punishment for you 
don't get on Twitter, okay? I'll take it. I'll view it as my responsibility as a pastor. I'll take it, and then I'll just tell you what's there so you don't have to live it out. Beth Moore tweeted out on Twitter, I'm growing grapes for reals, like it's a miracle, in 50 jillion degree weather. If Jesus is trying to get me to have a crush on him, it's working. <laughs> Crazy, right? It just blew up. Twitter storm. Jesus is not trying to get you to have a crush on him like a schoolgirl on the quarterback of the high school team. Our Trinitarian God, eternally the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God in three persons, has organized all of time and space itself so that you would be in absolute reverential awe of who he is. Time exists. There is a time for everything. And you are bound as a mere mortal by time because the timeless, immortal, unchangeable, majestic God wants you to, through time and life under the sun, come to a place where you stand in awe and fear of who he is. And our Trinitarian God is at his most awe-inspiring in the cross of Christ. This is the most awe-inspiring view of the Trinitarian God we get because there we see the perfect, unchangeable plan of God that you can't add to his plan, you can't take it away. It all culminates in the work of Christ on the cross. The cross of Christ reveals God more fully than any event in the Bible. In the death of Christ, that God so loved, he, he loved the world that he would send his son. There was a time, just think about it. There is a timeless eternal God, but there was a time when he stepped into time to redeem those in time into a place where there is infinite time. The timeless God became incarnate at just the right time, the, at the appointed time. That's when the cross happened. Christ died for sinners not when like some stuff just happened and it was, he was going along with the flow like he's in the car with you and he's like, oh, oh, here it comes. I thought it was coming and it's finally here. Jesus can come now. It's the appointed time. Galatians 4, 4 through 6. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Romans 5, 6, for while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. And then Jesus prays in the high priestly prayer. When Jesus had spoken these words, this is what he said. Father, the hour has come. What's that? The appointed time has come. Glorify your son, that the son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over flesh. To do what? To give eternal life to whom you have given to him. God has put eternity into your heart. And that eternity, that longing for a place you've never been, that is realized when Christ gives you eternal life. And you see that it is in beholding this Trinitarian God and the cross of Christ and His death, burial, and resurrection. We behold their perfect plan in time, that it is in that reverential awe and that fear of God that we come to the place of repentance. We come to the place where we repent and we trust in Christ and we gain that which we all have been longing for. We gain eternal life. This eternal life is a current reality in which we possess right now. If you're a Christian, you possess eternal life. You live in a time-bound fallen world, but you as a person are now have entered into a reality of endless time to which we will experience. But it's your reality now. The eternal life is a current reality. And in the new creation, this is, I don't even know how to explain it to you. Hopefully I can do it. That when the timeless God stepped into time as Jesus Christ, true God and true man, he never stops living in a temporal reality. Okay? 
It's hard for us to grasp a place that has time, but there's no sin. Because everything we know about time, there's always bad things. Right? There's a time for peace. There's a time for war. But there once was a place where there is time. Right? You've got to live in a physical reality. You're a human being. You walk around in a succession of events. But at that time before the fall, it could have gone on forever. But the timeless, infinite God stepped into the world as a true human. And he doesn't stop it. He's a human being right now. And he will be forever. As far and as far. You can't, you can't go further. From here to infinity. It will go forever. Jesus is a man. Here's what's wild. <laughs> okay. When Christ returns, the resurrection of the dead happens. We go to Revelation 21. What do we see? We see in Revelation 21 that the dwelling of God, that's heaven. right? We think of heaven as this it's this atemporal place. That place comes to earth and the two become the same thing. Why? why right? Physical reality now becomes heaven. Physical reality, it's called the new heavens and the new earth. This earth passes away. Christ returns. He renews all things. Because Christ is forever physical. Heaven itself, the dwelling of God, becomes a physical reality. That's mind-blowing. And in this place, because of Christ and His work, and this new creation, because of Christ, there will be no time to die. There will be no time to pluck up, no time to kill. There will be no time to weep. There will be no time to mourn. There will be no casting away stones or refraining from, or refraining from embracing. There will be no time to lose. There will be no time to cast away. There will be no time to tear. There will be no time to keep silent. There will be no time for hate and no time for war. For these things which bind us and burden us in this world, there will be no more time. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. And I pray that we would leave with a grander view of who you are and we would carry it on with us through the week. And this would impact our life and the way that we live, how we give thanks, and how we live in the present moment, receiving from you grace every day. Help us to learn that there is a time for reverential awe, and the time is always now. And if there's any here that isn't a Christian, God, I pray that you would awaken them, remove the scales from their eyes, Cause them to behold the glory of God in the face of Christ, to see His majesty, and this would bring them to repentance and faith, that you would grant a new birth in Jesus' name. Amen.